2020, this is the biggest issue right now. These mail-in ballots and the big push for it. You know that it's going to be a corrupt election when Hillary Clinton is pushing for mail-in ballots. And welcome to Whiskey Politics. I'm Dave Sussman, your host and purveyor here at Whiskey Politics. Find me at davesussman.com. And uh, you can also find us at the Range Broadcasting Network. It's a new platform, and we're uh, deeply honored to be on this new platform with some other great uh, shows as well. You can find that at ragebroadcasting.com. And of course, you can find us on YouTube. And please subscribe, hit the like button, share it, uh, get the word out regarding whiskey politics. Uh, you can find us on all of our podcast applications, uh, the Ricochet Network, uh, where you can watch and listen. And of course, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and uh, Stitcher. And uh, please find us on all of our social media applications as well and because we've got a long weekend this weekend and uh, not too sure what you're doing but in my neck of the woods the restaurants are closed the beaches are closed it's not a lot that people are going to be able to do this weekend so we decided to pack in three great interviews for you and we'll put in the timestamps for each of these interviews below you can find them in our liner notes and also as i'm introducing them here uh in this in this introduction so you can skip forward come back see another interview at another time or just sit back and relax and enjoy three whiskey politics interviews in a row uh not something we do all that often but uh, we're delighted to have uh three fantastic individuals patriots all in their own right we will be starting off with Pete Santelli. Uh, Pete Santelli, he's a news commentator and an analyst. Uh, you can find him at the PeteSantilliShow.com. He is also the vice president of RangeBroadcasting.com, where you will find whiskey politics, and we're very proud to be there. So uh, definitely want to check out this interview with Pete. I was lucky enough to be on his show last week, and we've also got a link below if you want to watch that episode as well. Uh, I'm going to be talking with Pete a lot about the state of the election right now, what Trump needs to do to turn things around, or does he need to turn things around? Uh, we're going to get into it and uh, get some advice from Pete, who's certainly been around the block a few times when it comes to politics and uh, what we're looking at for the next four months before the election. And because it's Independence Day, 4th of July, I wanted to have a warrior, a true warrior, join us to talk about uh, his perspective on things right now in the United States, what's happening around the world. And uh, we're going to be delighted to have Justin Sheffield, who is an author of a new book, Mob 6, A SEAL Team 6 Operator's Battles in the Fight for Good Over Evil. Now, you may be wondering, what is Mob 6? Well, there are special forces. There are the U.S. Navy SEALs. And then there is a select and secretive group of highly trained operators known as SEAL Team 6, and they refer to themselves as Mob 6. And when it comes to talking about the most experienced, effective, and exclusive group of deadly warriors on the world, Sheffield is a part of that group, and you can literally count that group on a hand or two. None have served more combat operations. Sheffield's count is more than a thousand at this point. None have taken out more of America's enemies and fought for freedom around the globe. And none who still draw a breath today have paid a greater physical and emotional price for serving their country. So I'm looking forward to having Justin on and discuss, obviously, this elite patriot warrior, not only his previous fights, but what he is now fighting for, and it is other soldiers coming home and facing the demons of their experience in the theater. And then what about the children? What about the kids? I don't know about you, but one of the common denominators that really concerns me is seeing the age, the demographic of so many of these kids that are protesting and rioting and tearing down statues and trying to tear down our institutions and looting and everything else. And, you know, you have to ask yourself, as a country, as it advanced when it comes to education, as America is, are we, do we have a, a, a generational problem now where what we're seeing on our TV represents a uh, vast majority of groupthink with the younger generation. So it's deeply concerning when we see as parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles, how this next generation is coming up with this idea that they could basically reinvent our economic systems 
to, uh, you know, essentially placate their ideological viewpoints of some utopian socialist society when they really don't have any idea about how economic systems work or history and democracy and civics, if they haven't learned it, is it no wonder that they can't understand the difference between a slave owner and an abolitionist? And they're just tearing down statues for the sake of it either way. So we're delighted to bring back to the show Michelle Balcone. She is an author, co-author with Art Laffer, uh, and uh, she has a series of books that let's chat about books, let's chat about democracy, let's chat about economics, and she's going to be giving us as parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, uh, some techniques, including her books, of course, on how we should discuss, have these discussions with a younger generation, because it really is up to us. So pour yourself your favorite drink, sit back and relax and enjoy the Whiskey Politics interviews with Pete Santelli, Justin Sheffield, and Michelle Balcone. And our first guest is somebody that I have been watching for years. He, he's not new on the scene, folks. Pete Santilli is the host of the Pat, Pete Santilli Show. He is an advocate and a certified financial advisor. I remember hearing him going on about the economic crisis 10 years ago and uh, the run-up as far as the uh, just this uh, incredible the amount of money that has been printed and what that's going to lead to in the bubbles. And uh, he's been kind of right on as far as all of that goes. He's also a legal expert and a commentator. He successfully defeated the Department of Justice prosecution in two federal criminal trials. He's also an investigative journalist and a forensic analyst and vice president of the new Range Broadcasting Network, where we are proud to have a platform now, Whiskey Politics. You can find us at rangebroadcasting.com. And uh, that's also the costclub.com, spree TV or spreely.com, evault.video. And uh, holy cow, how many other sites are you on? <laughs> Pete Santilli, we, welcome. How are you, my friend? We, uh, we have no choice but to just design our own n internet, since uh, especially me, uh, having been kicked off of uh, so many different platforms, we just built our own internet. That's exactly what people are talking about needing to be done today. I mean, everybody is being deplatformed, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or whatever it is. And we see these upstarts that are kind of coming out, many of them our people are calling conservative echo chambers like Parler, for example. Talk to us a little bit before we get into some of the good stuff, because I want to get your opinions on Trump and what he needs to do to win re-election, some of these incredible numbers that we just saw coming out today regarding the economy. But uh, talk about the, 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 the playing field that we have right now to get out the message. It, you know, I, um, I started uh, with Liberty One TV just before the midterm elections. Um, we had actually, actually my, my last month in broadcasting on Liberty One TV, um, which they had set up and, and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars advertising for a viewership, um, right before the midterms, Facebook deleted. We had all of our eggs in one basket. We were actually doing very well on Facebook. Uh, but they, they said that, uh, that we were, I guess, suspicious um, uh, actors on their platform. They thought we were Russian bots. They literally deleted us from 20 million uh, fans. Um, my last month there, I think I had reached like 4 million viewers on Facebook. Um, same trend here right before the 2020 election. Uh, what is happening here? I'm calling it high tech insurrection. They are literally election meddling. They're just basically cutting away uh, everyone from any conservative or alternative views. They just want one stream of consciousness. Uh, in your social media uh, feeds, and that is, you know, the, the leftist view. But that's exactly what's happening right now. I think after the election, then they're going to probably ease up a little bit. But uh, uh, right now, it's just, it's just outright high tech insurrection. You know, we've seen hundreds of people being deplatformed. Stefan Molyneux, who's the most recent big high profile guy, the guy's got over a million views. He's got over a million subscribers. He's got a billion views, I should say, and a million subscribers. Mm -hmm. And that guy's not alt right. He's not crazy far right. 
He's no. a he's a philosopher. Yeah, he waxes poetic on, on issues regarding immigration and such, which the left don't like to hear, but he doesn't say anything racist and he raises a lot of interesting thoughts and a lot of people like him. Now, I don't condone, you know, racism or, you know, white supremacy or anything like that. And those people, we should have a discussion, you know, the message that they're promulgating online. But they seem to be going after uh, not the marginalized far flungs now. They seem to be going just after right of center. Pete, what impact do you think that's going to have right now on the election? It's going to have a, a, a very, not, not just the dramatic impact, it must be stopped prior to the election. If President Trump, and I've been mentioning this um, several times over, I mean, if President Trump does not take action uh, to stop election meddling by Silicon Valley, uh, because essentially Silicon Valley and the mainstream media are working hand in hand, but he needs to stop uh, uh, Silicon Valley from election meddling, just allow the free flow of information. He needs to, I, I believe, invoke the Insurrection Act against these people that are wanting to perpetrate violence. I mean, they, they profess, the people on the left profess to be, you know, anti-fascist, anti-hate, um, and they somewhat profess to be advocates for freedom. But they're the exact opposite of all of that. Uh, but it's it's going to have a very significant impact because, as you can imagine, how many people do you think uh, right now that are listening to our voice just pay attention to politics? You know, once every two years or once every four years or right around election time. This is when it matters the most. Those people that don't generally follow politics, if you cut them off from what's going on in the political world, which way are they going to vote? So there's only going to be one way, and that is based on what they're seeing in their in their feeds. So mm -hmm. President Trump has to take action. He could potentially lose an election. And, and I'm pro-Trump, and I believe uh, all the polls are, uh, are not, you know, really a true reflection of what's going on. Uh, but it, it, things could change very dramatically here, uh, whether he takes action or doesn't take action. He could lose re-election if he doesn't. We've got Pete Santelli, folks. He is uh, a news commentator and analyst, and you can find him at the PeteSantelliShow.com, or you can find him also at PeteLive.tv. And uh, you do hours every single day, Pete. You know, we're just a small little show, you know, an hour or two every week. You, you, I mean, you're doing three, five, what is it, five hours every day? Five hours total, but uh, that's because I'm long-winded. I need the extra time. You're yeah. much more articulate, and you can get your message out in a more clear, concise fashion. Yeah, um, yeah, and and, and so you're 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 addressing the issues of the day, and one of the biggest issues that we're facing right now, it's kind of a hybrid of three issues. We've got the COVID nineteen. It looks like that we've got some spikes, and how those numbers are going to uh, essentially be wrangled and presented to the press depends upon how the testing is and how reliable that testing is. But we've got states like. Uh, California, Texas, and Florida, and other states that are now starting to lock down again. California, you can't go to the beach this weekend on 4th of July. Holy cow. Mm. You've got the economy, which is is rebounding. But you and I, and I was honored to be on your show last week, talked about this, that I think with stimulus and CARES and PPP, that essentially what we've done is we've kicked the can down the road and that there's going to be some economic trouble, especially for small businesses. And then third, the trifecta, you're in an election year, and we are now four months away from an election. F from a 50,000-foot view, before we get into some of your suggestions for President Trump, because I'm sure you've got many to, to win this thing, what is your lay of the land right now? What are you seeing, and how concerned are you? Uh, I, was, I was concerned, just as I mentioned when, uh, when you were on my show, if you have a, you know, a Black Monday or, you know, or a Black Friday, whatever it may be, uh, that's a one-day stock market drop, and then obviously we see the after effects several months down the road as to a, a recession, a recessionary downturn. Uh, what we've seen here in COVID-19 phase one uh, was three or four months of lockdown, which is unprecedented. We've never had an economic shutdown in, in the tens of trillions of dollars uh, just evacuated from the economy. Now we're going into this second phase where they want to lock us down again, and you'll notice that the um, I used to call them blue states, but the brown states uh, are once again locking down to have their effect on the economy right before the election. Um, th this will have a, a permanent 
devastating impact on each and every one of our lives. No doubt about it. I mean, I, I just cannot believe uh, that these, these brown states are insisting upon keeping us shut down because the numbers just don't justify it. For instance, killing 1,800 people because of you know, global economic depression for every one potential life that you're going to save is not good numbers. doesn't make very good sense. It's illogical. Um, millions of people will die from starvation. I mean, they say upwards of 7 million people died um, as a result of the Great Depression. Our population was much less than it is now. We're, we're potentially looking at tens of millions of people could die uh, from the after effects of this COVID-19 attack on our economy. That's insane. And what we are looking at right now are the numbers of tests that are coming back. And I want to talk about the test in just a moment because they are highly unreliable, like 50% unreliable, by the way. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, these antibody tests where they're taking your blood and seeing whether you've had it. They're using those numbers and they're conflating that with, you know, people that are testing with the swab up the nose whole thing. And they're using these numbers. Hospital numbers are going down. The numbers that are going up in hospitals, Pete, are people that have uh, essentially delayed elective surgeries that are now able to go and get the elective surgeries done that they couldn't do back in March, April, and May, and June. Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing those numbers increase, but the death numbers are going down. And so within two to four weeks after essentially the government, most state governments, most mayors, allowed for people to run rothschild through the streets of a major American cities, tearing down statues, breaking into stores, looting independent business owners, vandalizing. And I'm not talking about the peaceful protests. And you and I discussed this last week. We have no problem with peaceful protests and understand the reasoning why. We're absolutely, it was abhorrent what happened in Minneapolis. Put that to the side. We're now starting to see spikes of people, but many of those spikes are younger people, 20s, teens. And most of those people that are showing positive results, if they are showing any symptoms at all, they are mild. So this is a lot different than it was back in March, isn't it? It, it is. And the testing and, uh, you know, God bless President Trump when he mentioned, and he's a numbers guy. So he sees that the, the, the cases showing up or these spikes, quote unquote, come as a direct result of the massive numbers of millions of tests that they're doing. The younger people are not dying. Um, they may be uh, showing uh, the antibodies um, uh, or may, they may be testing positive, but their immune systems are so strong that they're able to overcome it just as they would the flu. Um, uh, we're also seeing, uh, of course, there's a separate issue that has to be contended with, and that is uh, the, the, I think it's like 44% of all of the COVID deaths were uh, from these uh, convalescent hospitals, uh, the older population. And there was some uh, intentional negligence. Uh, uh, I, I believe it was intentional negligence because they went against the, um, uh, the CDC guidelines. But back, back to my point, if you really look at the numbers and you break down the numbers, um, it does not make sense. I mean, if, if, if for instance, we were to, you know, to test the entire population um, for the flu, uh, during the during the flu season um, doesn't necessarily indicate a pandemic. I mean, we don't say, oh my goodness, everyone has the flu or a large percentage of our population has, has the flu, which we do every single flu season. Um, the number of deaths uh, and it is, is most important. I understand those numbers are going down right now. Uh, the, the true hard numbers are going down. We're, we're seeing herd immunity, essentially, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. So locking us down actually prevents that herd immunity that's taking place uh, right now, if, if they were to lock us back down. Um, you know what? We have a lot more information now for us to make decisions as to whether or not we should be, you know, personally wearing a mask or worried about uh, contracting um, uh, coronavirus based on our age and our underlying circumstances. Uh, I, I'm now seeing numbers uh, that gives me more confidence that I can Basically, I got a greater chance of dying walking down the sidewalk, getting hit by a skateboard, skateboarder uh, than I do contracting COVID-19. 
So I want to make a personal decision to just live my life and come and go freely. A skateboarder. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a higher That's how specific uh, that statistic is. Oh, there's a higher probability, right? Because the number of people that die from walking down the sidewalk getting hit by skateboarders is, is about that number that could be applied to the chances of me contracting coronavirus. I didn't see? know that was a stat. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. <laughs> So, so the, what are we doing here? I, I, there was um, a, a, a picture. We just put it up on Whiskey Politics on our Facebook page this morning. There was a picture last night of City Hall, downtown LA, and there was a huge, massive rally uh, essentially supporting defunding the police. And again, you've got thousands of people. They're not practicing social distancing. But mm -hmm. now I cannot go into a restaurant in much of California and sit in socially distanced tables. Uh, I cannot go to the beach and enjoy a socially distanced day at the beach on 4th of July weekend on a public beach, yet they are allowing these massive groups to protest. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think people, even, even people that may not listen to our show, are waking up to the hypocrisy here? Everyone needs to know. This may sound... Uh, sensational. It may sound dramatic, uh, but I've read both Antifa's and Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter's manifesto. Um, the revolutionary abolitionist movement wrote a manifesto that outlined exactly what they are. Uh, they 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 called for and wrote for and have trained their people uh, for a violent uh, revolution, essentially. If, if you have not recognized that these are insurrectionists um, that will by any means necessary overthrow our system of gov governance, th then you're not paying attention and you're not listening to them because in their own words, these are Marxists that intend to by any means necessary to overthrow our system of government. So everything we're seeing here with the protests to defund the police, and uh, which, which is a ludicrous idea, we could spend a whole uh, episode just talking about that concept alone. But these are Marxists. Uh, we, we, must, we must stop them because things are going to get much more intense as we get closer to the election. Right now, you have what I believe to be um, this, this front face of this thing. These peaceful protesters are nothing but human shields to the violent operatives that are lurking among them. You saw a guy out in Utah. He just stepped out there with a gun and shot somebody that was right in, you know, driving down the street. Yeah, um, these peaceful protesters uh, are just like the Palestinians. Same ta tactics that they employed out there. Everyone agrees with the you know uh, the, the plight of the Palestinian. They deserve you know medications and food and stuff like that. They shouldn't have their supply lines disrupted. Uh, but those were human shields to potentially Hamas you know suicide bombers that are mingling among them right there at the border. Same tactics are being employed here. Uh, yes, they are peaceful protesters, but that's not what you should be paying attention to. You need to worry about Antifa and Bureau of Land uh, Bureau of Land Management. Listen to me, BLM. Uh, <laughs> Black Lives Matter. Um, I can't uh, understand why you would go to BLM in your mind. Uh, I mean, <laughs> BLM. <laughs> you got some history there. We can talk about that, but uh, yeah. I do. Yeah. Oh. B uh, Bureau of Land Management is BLM, not Black Lives Matter. Uh, right. let, let's talk a little bit about, um, I, I, I think the numbers that came out today are showing that the economy is heading in the right direction. Mm. And you and I discussed this last week. Uh, folks, we'll put the link to the show that uh, I was uh, honored to be a guest of uh, on Pete's show last week. And we'll, we'll put a link below. So if you're watching this uh, on YouTube or our uh, ricochet or any of other podcast applications or whatever it is find the link and listen to it because it's 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 i think we cover a lot of really important information about the economy uh, listen the economy i believe is trump's strength he's got a lot of weaknesses and i want to hear what your perspective is on that and how he needs to answer to those weaknesses to win the election here as we speak today but the economy heading in the right direction i definitely believe it takes some of the wind out of the Democrat cells. They need a recession to win the election in November. We know this. Bill Maher said it a year ago. 
and they certainly have taken advantage of it. But do you think we're in July of 2020, we've got four months to go. Do you think this trajectory continues unless they continue pumping stimulus into the small business economy? Well, yeah, the short term impact of pumping uh, stimulus into the system is uh, is what's it's what's needed. Um, I I really don't know how uh, President Trump is going to be able to get out of. I mean, the long term effects of printing cash and throwing it to, into the system is you know when when you look at the you know the Nasdaq and the and the Dow and all these companies. Uh, and banks, the financial institutions, their balance sheets look beautiful because you've just sprinkled paper everywhere and it's artificial. Um, it's manufactured, uh, but true productivity. I mean, you have to picture this. Um, what are we producing right now that's going to justify? What about the, you know, the sales of products and items, manufacturing plants being shut down because of a lockdown and stuff like that? If you picture our gross national product, what are we literally producing is there true growth there um you know a bank having lots of money to lend and moving paper and doing all of that stuff is just artificial it's just putting a band-aid on it but i will say this without a doubt president trump knows his numbers i've studied this man for decades i actually uh, way back when i a little known thing i used to uh work as an internet marketer for the trump network help build the trump network so i've i've watched the trump organization I've watched President Trump and the way he analyzes his numbers. He knows them. Uh, if you're considering, if you're middle of the road, you're just now paying attention to politics and you're wondering, you know, should I go the Biden route or should I go with President Trump? Well, you want somebody that not only knows how to turn the economy around, but he's already shown and produced the most productive economy in the history of mankind. And that is the truth. Brought our manufacturing back. Um, we need to do that. I want to see manufacturing plants opening up. Uh, he, he had a, a trend with these uh, trade deals, especially uh, opening up Apple plants. Uh, you've got shipbuilding plants. I want heavy manufacturing um, uh, just flourishing like crazy. It needs to happen as quickly as possible. The job numbers are up. Um, where are those jobs coming from? I want to, I want to take a look at that. Which, which sectors? Uh, are those jobs coming They're from? They're across it- a wide variety of sectors, service, hospitality, uh, you know, restaurants, small business. The problem is, is That's though, a that a lot of that is related to PPP, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so as a business owner, you better hire back those people. Otherwise, that PPP grant turns to a loan. That's right. And so, you know, how long does that stick? And if we now are starting to see lockdowns again, mm. Uh, another holiday weekend that mm-hmm. small business owners can no longer capitalize on. And you know that these are the weekends where restaurants and places, you know, to go, people mm-hmm. travel, they go to the beach, they enjoy their day, they spend money. And first you lost, first you lost Easter and Passover week, then you mm-hmm. lost Memorial Day, and now you're losing 4th of July. Mm-hmm. These people can't catch a breath. And, and there's the Independent Restaurant Association. I think we talked about this last week. The Independent Restaurant Association is estimating that 80%, not 8 or 18, 8-0% of independent restaurants will not survive. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I mean, they, were, they were barely surviving when they were flourishing. 3-7% to margins. 7% margins. Yeah. Yes, that's right. It may, they're, they're just just scrapping it together to begin with this is devastating it's uh it's terrible and and that's what i what i did not want to see and that's what i was referring to uh, what is our true uh productivity when we start seeing job numbers and economic growth uh, what's it coming from are we producing things are we manufacturing or is it coming from you know the service sector and banking you know they produce nothing uh they're just interventionists um did you so, hear? Did you hear your financial guy? Did you hear the Fed is now starting to buy stocks in private companies? Yes, and public I did companies hear that. as well. I yes. mean, we know that they were with quantitative easing, QE one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, whatever it is, that they were buying securities, bonds, and and, and the like from the banks to flood mm-hmm. the market with cash. They're now buying stocks. 
Yeah, taking equity positions in companies like that. I mean, I, I, I am for that. Uh, I mean, instead of just uh, handing out money willy nilly, there, there needs to, you know, you need to have some skin in the game. And if you have to surrender an equity position in exchange for, for some money, I just believe it needs to be short term and then wean their way out of it. But the, the Fed itself, uh, the Federal Reserve, is a private entity. We, we know that. I think you already know that. Hopefully, you know. Yes, you do know that. <laughs> the Department of Treasury, I would say, I would want the Department of Treasury to have that temporary stake. They've been more or less co the con Federal conjoined, Reserve. though, over the past year, haven't they? Yes. As a matter of fact, that was through the last, uh, I, I read, I don't know if you did, it was a 700-page stimulus package. I went, the way I read that thing, uh, that night, I actually opened it up and I went right down to page 800 and something and read it backwards. By about three or four pages up, I noticed how conjoined the Department of the Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank and yeah. the World Bank, for that matter, were intertwined. It was all buried down at the bottom. So, yes. But I, I want... The Department of the Treasury, why? Because, because it's, it's we the people and it has to be temporary. I think the Department of Treasury, it would be better in their hands than a private banking entity such as the, the Federal Reserve. Right, right. Yeah. So, okay, we've got, we've got economic issues. Uh, if it goes in the right direction, that definitely helps President Trump. But I've been very critical of President Trump for the past six weeks. I like his policies. I think mm -hmm. he's done the right thing. I, I, I like his judges. I like his, uh, you know, taking uh, basically a, a hacksaw to regulations in this country. Those are all good things. I'm not happy with the way he's been communicating lately. I believe that he missed a wonderful opportunity as president of the United States the, where he should have sat at the resolute desk in the Oval Office and addressed the nation when this whole thing began with George Floyd and the riots. He mm. didn't do it. And, I, and I, to me, I, it's unconscionable. It was such a waste of opportunity. You know, you and I both know that he could be presidential. We've seen it at the State of the Union, one of the best, the recent one, 2020, was one of the best State of the Unions I've seen in my lifetime. Presidents left and right. It was an excellent State of the Union. He can be presidential. So he's mm. losing votes right now. We're seeing the polls. James mm -hmm. Carville, before we went on the air, I mentioned to you, I just, I just learned that James Carville and Mary Matlin are, are divorcing. I was surprised by that because they were the kind of the go-to default of showing how the left and right could actually live together in harmony. Mm. But James Carville came out last week and he stated that he believes that, uh, that there is a, uh, he's, Trump is more likely to drop out of the 2020 race than be reelected. That's what we're starting to hear. And I'm starting to hear a lot of murmurings amongst conservatives, a lot of hand wringing and pearl clutching right now, saying, holy crap, we could lose this thing. And it is full blown Marxism in this country because we know Biden is just a puppet for the far left. What mm. does Trump need to do to turn this thing around? He, he needs to put more pressure on the do nothing Republicans that are taking a knee, number one, because I, I'll tell you what. Um, we have a communist insurrection going on. And if we can't get our GOP, which are supposed to be the law and order party, to rally behind President Trump to say, we're going to stop this thing. It's economically destroying us. If They're not stopping this Marxism. They're literally enabling Marxism by doing nothing to stop it. You've got the House of Representatives working on climate change plans and, and uh, defunding the police. The GOP has been weak around President Trump. Uh, I believe that President Trump, there, there, there's another element here that hasn't been spoken of uh, very much, and that is the for, foreign influence on, on these riots and this, um, this uh, subversion uh, and the destabilization here in the United States of America. I think that they've been analyzing, and I've, I'm listening closely uh, to the words of uh, William Barr. They're investigating this, and I think they have been for quite some time. So this is what I, I think, and this is just a, a gut feeling that I have, because he's a sharp guy. I think he's been watching this play out, knowing full well what he's getting from military intelligence and the NSA as to who's be, behind this stuff. Because him speaking to the American people uh, to quell 
uh, an organic uprising would be important if it were an organic uprising, and it's not. So who is he speaking to when he goes from the Resolute desk and speaks to the masses? He's going to be speaking to a bunch of people that want nothing to do with what's happening in the streets, the majority of them. So I think he's allowing this to play out, and I think we're going to see, see some serious, serious action from the Department of Justice with a lot of arrests of these uh, top leaders in Antifa, uh, in the uh, Black Lives Matter movement. We even have money laundering going on. You see that uh, Joe Biden, I saw it this morning, Joe Biden leads, not only in the polls, but in fundraising. And I go to Black Lives Matter, I click on the link. You can take a look at the link. I think you, you even uh, pointed that out to me. It goes right to Act Blue. Yep. Of course, Joe Biden is leading in fundraising. It's all being laundered through Black Lives Matter. So there needs to be an investigation there. I think the, the FEC needs to look into that. Back to my point, I think that President Trump knows so much about what's happening behind the scenes from his military intelligence, because it's a very serious thing. The NSA is tracking every single telephone call and conversation. Those that are trying to subvert us and to destabilize us, if they're involved with foreign actors, we're now detecting that China shipped 11,000 gun parts uh, into Louisville, Kentucky. They're, they're now shipping guns into the United States of America. Um, try, try, say that again. China is shipping guns to Kentucky? China, uh, just within the past 24 hours, there was a shipment of 11,000 uh, assault uh, weapon parts that were shipped illegally. To whom? And, and whoever the entity is, they're under investigation, but they intercepted the shipment in Louisville, Kentucky, Kentucky but there was a company in Florida uh, that, it, that we're supposed to be receiving those parts. Well, as you can imagine, those were just parts in a separate shipment of, I'm sure, the other parts to the assault weapons will be arriving at different locations. That's how they move guns around. 11,000, so significant that these parts are showing up um, and, and they're, they're being caught. Can you imagine how many shipments have come through uh, where they were not detected? So we've got some serious things happening, I believe, uh, and I want to give President Trump the benefit of the doubt, but he needs to act within the next 90 days, very decisively, very swiftly against these top leaders. Politically, it's going to look terrible right on the front doorstep of an election. It's going to, it's going to look political, uh, but he has an obligation right now, including with the GOP, to protect American communities and, and American uh, ways of life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Pete Santilli, you're a senior advisor to President Trump. And you walk into the White House Oval Office today, and President Trump is open-minded to listen to you. He can put his ego to the side. Give him the three things he needs to do to win re-election. Uh, number one, first and foremost, uh, declare Silicon Valley. I mean, what, what they're doing is high-tech insurrection. They're complicit in this thing, even above and beyond shutting down the fake news. Um, they have more power than three branches of government, and they're abusing that power. He must rein in uh, high, high tech or Silicon Valley, number one. Number two, he must stop to a screeching halt. The potential for voter fraud is huge with these mail-in ballots. Yeah, yeah. Go to voter ID, do that immediately because of the potential for fraud. If he does not do that before the election, we're not talking about changing things and reforming stuff after the election. No, the election could be decided whether or not he takes action in that regard. And lastly, you know, we, we've got people destroying monuments that are, as, in, as far as I'm concerned, whether you agree or disagree with the political, you know, leanings of the person that's on that statue, it's a priceless monument uh, of our history. Can't just delete that. They're destroying public property. They're destroying cities. Um, he, I believe, must, because things are going to get worse closer to the election. He must invoke the Insurrection Act. People Explain what the Insurrection Act allows the president to do. You know, he, he has to uh, use the U.S. military as the, as the last line of defense in our country. I mean, this, this is an insurrection. They're trying to overthrow our constitutional republic. But using uh, the military, uh, whereas state officials, a governor or a mayor, uh, does not provide for the security of the local residents and protecting their, their civil rights and their constitutional rights within the, the res respective states. Uh, for the purposes of doing what? Of winning an election? 
of winning an election. That's that's what this is all about. Is mm -hmm. this is for political purposes? Uh, they're trying to destabilize even their local communities. It impacts the economy, and it looks uh, you know good for them in favor of of their uh, their efforts to advance Marxism. Those three things. He must invoke the Insurrection Act. Things are going to be terrible within the 30-day window to the election. Uh, people are going to have a different attitude about going to the streets and perpetrating violence in order to manipulate the, the minds of the masses right before the election uh, if he's invoked the Insurrection Act. We just need to restore law and order. Everybody right. vote. Let's protect everyone's constitutional rights. So let's go back through those because I, I, I think that they are absolutely critical. And the first one is social media. And uh, we talked about, we opened up today's episode talking about how we're now starting to see so many people deplatformed that are not crazy, far right, alt right, you know, anti Semite, uh, racist, bigots. These are just people philosophizing on, 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 on shows with millions and millions of views, and they are being taken off. These are private company platforms. How do you do this? Private company platforms that have built the public square have an obligation to protect the constitutional rights of everybody coming and going freely. Their, their utilities, how do I know that they're utility? You can call them private companies. I mean, it, not you, but anybody can call them. You hear this from the, the GOPers. Oh, we want free market principles. They're a private company. Right. Uh, well, hold on a second. They just received immunity because they established themselves as a utility providing a pipeline for the free flow of information. And therefore, they're not a publisher and they get immunity under uh, the Communications Decency Act of Section 230. The biggest thing they can do is to enforce CDA Section 230. The biggest thing that President Trump can do immediately is just to enforce that. And we're not talking about the heavy hand of government coming down upon Silicon Valley. Uh, let's just apply the standard. Are, are you a publisher or are you not? Yeah. And if, in fact, they are a publisher, they should be held accountable for the mass deletions uh, that, that they're doing uh, because they're enjoying the benefits of both. Stefan Molyneux mm -hmm. should be able to sue somebody for what they have done to him. He has his civil rights having been violated. He has done nothing to, to advocate for violence. He's a free, I mean, just a brilliant mind. That was stunning to me that they could do that to Stefan Molyneux. If you were to try to sue them right now, you'd be unsuccessful uh, because they're double dipping as a utility or a non-utility, as a publisher, non, and they, they'll have 11 attorneys on it. So the, the legal recourse that we have just by them enforcing the CDA, uh, uh, sec the CDA Section 230 has huge ramifications. Now, even if they start enforcing it now, it's not going to impact the election. I mean, they, they have to do something here with uh, the, the overhanging threat of an antitrust suit, a big one, okay? Uh, that will stop them because that'll have long-term uh, impacts on, on these companies. They're fearful of antitrust suits. I do know that. Yeah, but uh, that's not before the, the election. Hmm? Not before the election. You say not before the election? Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that will not be implemented. So what does Trump do? Does he take an executive order to private companies and, and say that they are, uh, that, that 230 needs to be enforced? How does he do that? What, he, what, you know, what measures does he have to use there? I this is not, not a radical concept if you start thinking about their involvement in this thing. I mean, they're promoting uh, Antifa. They're promoting a leftist agenda. If he invokes the Insurrection Act, Silicon Valley could be potentially implicated uh, as a high-tech insurrectionist assisting the advancement of this Marxist agenda. I mean, there's, there's money that is flowing through these Silicon Valley uh, companies. He could uh, threaten to hold them accountable for being complicit in, a, uh, in, a, uh, in, in an insurrection. Uh, and they, they need to stop, reinstate everybody, right, as many people as they can, and do so immediately, yeah, effective. Yeah you know, within a matter of a couple of weeks. We need to do that right now. But we're four months from the election. Right. He needs to act swiftly, decisively, or I, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I, I mentioned to you last week on the show that we, our, our recent, one of our, our last episode before this one, in fact, uh, we had Zach McElroy, who was the Facebook moderator. He is the whistleblower that uh, came out on Project Veritas 
James O'Keefe's uh, organization. And they had a lot of undercover video. Uh, and it shows that uh, a vast majority of these moderators are far left and they will take down any uh, right of center. If you're wearing a MAGA hat, you're gone. They consider Republicans terrorists. This is, this is the verbiage that they are using. Uh, how does somebody like a Zuckerberg, okay, uh, or, or Jack Dorsey, how do they b implement such measures when it, I, I think Zuckerberg, whatever you think of him, I may have said this to you last week, I think he's kind of the, the tip of the spear, but like, you know, does he really know what the, the, the folks in the boiler room are doing on a moment to moment basis? How does that get implemented and allow for freedom of ideas when, you've, when you're hiring so many people, let's say, you know, 90, 98% of them are far leftists? You know, I've worked uh, in Southern California. I was there for 26 years. And uh, when I first came out of the service, I actually worked for a manufacturing company back when manufacturing used to be in Southern California. Um, but, you know, a lot of the employees in big manufacturing plants, um, uh, I ne never once, and I've hired a lot of people, never once did I say, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And right. try to determine, and, and, and then establish, well, well, I need to know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat because you might sabotage my operation. How about this? How about we allow people to be Democrats and Republicans? You can even be radical leftists, but stop them from deleting messages. Facebook should say, guess what? If you've broken the law and you're out there um, uh, using your speech and, and actually breaking the law, what do we do? We call the police and we hold that person accountable. But nobody should be deleting any messages. If there's illegal activity, this is what they need to do. And this is how you hold people accountable. You're the one that picks up the phone. You witness this message. You call the police and say, I just saw this guy threatening to kill somebody. I need to turn this over to you. Uh, I'll tell you what, immediately people are going to, they're going to say, well, I, I don't know. That's marginal. It may not necessarily be against the law, but you're going to be filing a police report and you better be telling the truth that this justifies law enforcement intervention. Outside of that, let the information flow. I don't want to be controlling what their political persuasion is in the workplace. That's not necessary unless you're Facebook and you're, you're basically deleting your political opponent. These See, this is, Silicon that's Valley the company. slippery slope though, right? I mean, when we take a look at, listen, I don't want Nazis. I don't want white supremacists. I don't want anti-Semites. I went to Gab a couple of years ago. You remember Gab? G-A-B? Yeah. Okay. Right. I went to Gab. I'm like, yes, freedom of speech. Let's, let's have another platform. And yeah. I got there, and within five minutes, I learned what three parentheses around somebody's name means. Okay? I mean, who are these people? They're basically the refuse. I don't even know what that means, but, uh, it, but it, that's, that, that's how they tell each other that somebody is Jewish. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. I didn't even know that. Echoes. Wow. They're called echoes. Okay. And, and parentheses around somebody's name, and I'm know. not too sure what the lineage is of that, but all of a sudden, it was like the, 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 the landfill of Twitter you yeah. know, is, 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 that's, that's what was promulgated. And I'm hoping other sites like Cloud Hub and Parler and MeWe mm -hmm. and some of the right. others that are now upstarts don't right. turn into that. But, yeah. okay, so what if, you, if you're a, 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 um, a programmer at Facebook or Twitter and you see those people, okay, so where does that line exist between freedom of speech and allowing people to say what they want to say and somebody that is wearing a MAGA hat and saying mm -hmm. that, you know, I have a problem with the Islamists, not, not Muslims, but the mm. Islamists, the mm. Ilhan Omar sponsored discussions with Hamas and Hezbollah who, mm. and, and, and Iran that say death to America. Where yeah. does that line exist? And should it be up to a company like Facebook to determine it? And if so, then how do we come in and say, okay, but you no. can't get rid of these people, but you can get rid of those people. That's where well, I think the problem is, right? Here's the deal. Well, I'm a constitutionalist. Yeah. Um, so much so that even my, my political views, even my, my sexual preferences as well. I'm a heterosexual. I'm a meat eater. I went out and protested on behalf of the, um, the LGBTQ. We didn't even have an acronym back then in Southern California, but their right to not have government interference in their lives. People are a lot. You, you're, 
know, I fought for the rights of the, the gays in Southern California to, to get married and, and keep the government out of the bedroom. But that just as an example, I believe that, that there's a minority view if you're a Nazi or you're a Ku Klux Klanner. Or, but I believe that society will shun them because the majority of us are not anti-Semitic. We're not Nazis. We're not hate speechers. And there will be social pressure to push those people out. I'll give you an example. Gab right now is damaged goods. Nobody is going to yeah. go to Gab because those people are present. Can they survive economically? I say let the free market decide where Gab goes. And they're basically in the tank right now because they're known to just have a bunch of Nazis. Uh, that, but that but if, if you own owned Gab, mm -hmm. if you own Gab, you don't want to be damaged goods. So what do you do? Do you decide on your own that you're going to go in and uh, censor or deplatform some of these people? That's your decision. Yeah. You're saying it's yeah. up to the owner. Uh, no, I, I'm saying that it should be up to society to block that. Like, if I don't like Nazis, I'm going to block Nazis. I don't want them in my stream at all. I'm going to shun them. Right. For instance, I wear a red MAGA hat that has nothing to do with the stigma of being a racist and a, you know, a Nazi and all this stuff. I want nothing to do with racism. I want nothing to do with Nazism, and it's right. a very, very small percentage of our society. I believe we need to self-police. These platforms gotcha. have an obligation, uh, actually the Supreme Court ruling, Marsh versus Alabama, that says that these companies have built the public square. They have an obligation, first and foremost, to protect the constitutional rights of, uh, of their users, of the American people, or you know, people that, I mean, they're American companies. Obviously, they have an obligation. Uh, to, to uphold uh, constitutional values, but let society police and shun those minority views. I agree with that. I do. I agree with that. Second, the second big point that you had was something uh, regarding these aren't private companies. This is the right to vote and the, uh, uh, the, the, the enfranchisement, if you will, okay, of the vote. We're seeing voter harvesting in states like California, yeah. where you and I could just go to somebody's house and take their ballot and say, hey, you're, you know, you don't need to go. We can take it for you. Any person can do this now legally in the state of California. They now mm -hmm. want to turn it into vote by mail. And we're seeing cities all across the country where millions of ballots are arriving at people's homes for previous owners that live there or haven't lived there for 20 years, dead mm -hmm. people in the millions, Right. And anybody could fill out these ballots and send them in. And mm -hmm. I am not a tinfoil hat guy, but I firmly believe that what we are seeing right now with the extensions of the lockdowns and the discussions about, you know, uh, not having uh, 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 precincts open in November mm -hmm. because of social distancing, that everything has to go to vote by mail, I believe that is the theft of an election because we know exactly where those ballots are going to be coming from, the mail-in mm -hmm. votes. How does President Trump address that? Instantly. Now, he's been hesitating to do this because he's trying to leave it up to the states. And if the states refuse to do it, he must implement voter ID. And I'll give you an example. Um, if, if I were to uh, send you a transaction and pay you one penny via PayPal. We could track that transaction. You know that I'm alive, you're alive, I transmit it both ways. And we could conceivably say that that transaction, that live transaction, had you at one end with your profile, maybe you're a Democrat or Republican, and I'm casting a vote for you. And it's instantaneous. And every single vote is counted. And we know that Pete Santilli is, you know, eligible to vote, and I can transmit that vote electronically. You'd stay home, and we could track these, we could track these votes. Um, and it's only one vote per person. Voter ID can be very precisely um, uh, implemented to only allow for those people that are alive and that are eligible to vote. And it could happen immediately. Uh, they just need to. Now, the left, I will say this, the left will push back on that. They say, oh, that's suppression of the. No, it's not. You know what it is? Uh, I have looked at, and I'm not a tinfoil hatter either, but I'm accused of being one when I say that the left is involved in voter fraud. No, I've read the Department of Justice indictments for the people that perpetrated voter fraud. Uh, they're sending busloads of people to most, multiple jurisdictions to vote multiple times. They've gotten caught doing it. 
I've read the indictments. I've read, I've seen the convictions of all of the left uh, leaners uh, that are perpetrating voter fraud. Uh, 2020, this is the biggest issue right now. These mail-in ballots and the big push for it. You know that it's going to be a corrupt election when Hillary Clinton is pushing for mail-in ballots. And, and, and that's, just not, that's not just to pick on crooked Hillary. Um, she knows that the Central Intelligence Agency has been practicing uh, these tactics and techniques all around the world for many, many decades. They know how to do this. They could have so many ballots printed, and we watched it in Florida. They had tractor trailers showing up at the last second in jurisdictions where they were, where they were short. That was a trial run uh, in the midterm elections for what could potentially come if it's not stopped. We cannot allow for mail-in ballots in this 2020 election. Absolutely not. We need to count every single vote. I, be I believe I deserve a free and fair election. You deserve a free and fair election. If President Trump doesn't take those three steps, you're not going to be guaranteed a free and fair election. But he, he has an obligation to do the things that I'm suggesting here. To so stop Silicon Valley, to stop the mail-in ballots, and to, uh, and to invoke an insurrection act. I want a free and fair election and a peaceful one as well. So we one of the things, that. yeah, one of the things that we just learned because of the Supreme Court, thank you, Chief Justice Roberts, that mm -hmm. a, an executive order can be implemented. And even if it's unconstitutional, that apparently can be made into laws. We saw uh, in the last week regarding DACA. OK, mm -hmm. uh, you know, President Obama implemented it. It was not con on the constitutional, but I don't know what the heck happened to Chief Justice Souter. I'm sorry, Roberts. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if President Trump was to implement by executive order a voter ID act, it will go to the courts, okay? It may take years before it actually is decided on, mm. okay? Lower courts, upper courts, Supreme Court, I'm sure it will get to that. Mm -hmm. um, how does that, is that something that could be implemented and uh, enforced in four months? Again, back to the, you know, invoking the Insurrection Act. He's got a lot of power in that regard. And if uh, with, um, I would say, the oversight of legal um, authorities, such as the Department of Justice, for the purposes of having a free and fair election, there's already enough evidence right now. There's been indictments for people perpetrating uh, voter fraud. We've already seen it. There's evidence of it. It's not a conspiracy theory. We cannot have this in the 2020 election. If there's evidence, and I know that there is, that they've been surveilling military intelligence, the NSA has been surveilling these people that are attempting to overthrow mm -hmm. um, our, our constitutional republic. If there's any evidence that that's what they intend to do, declaring or invoking the Insurrection Act could potentially allow for, because you see this in other countries where there's destabilization, there's, there's war-torn countries, but what do they do? They have a system set up with, you know, ballot integrity, and they've got military people protecting those ballot boxes. You see this in other country. We would have to do that now because we're, they're about to overthrow us yeah. in the, with these methods that they're employing. You have to counter it. You can't say, well, they're private companies. You know, they're printing ballots. Can't stop them. We just need to tell the public that they should be aware that they're about to lose their country. No, there's too much at stake here in 2020. I Pete, think last last question this. for you, and I greatly appreciate you taking the time today. And, uh, you know, we're covering so many of these issues of what Trump needs to do. But again, four months out, uh, I'm not asking you to prognosticate because everything seems to change on the dime right now, day to day. Oh, yeah. But where, where do you think, realistically, forget the polls for a moment, where do you think the chances are right now to see a continuation of, of Trump? Or are we really going to lose this country? Uh, I think that, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, coughing just because uh, this is going to be difficult for people to absorb, even, you know, among my fellow Trumpian supporters. Um, opinions change on a dime. Mm -hmm. Things change on a dime. The world will be completely different when a lot of people are arrested for attempting this coup d'etat. There's been an investigation. The Department of Justice is, is investigating it. And when the DOJ steps forward and our military intelligence steps forward and says, folks, this is what's been going on. These are the people in charge of it. Uh, 
the entire left has been co-opted. They attempted to overthrow our constitutional republic. All of a sudden, President Trump will have the news cycle for, you know, the, the next six weeks at least. Hopefully they can time it just right so that the American public that's paying attention learns uh, and things will be completely different. Those that are discouraged and saying, oh, my goodness, Joe Biden's winning. Uh, that's mm-hmm. going to change within a matter of a couple of days once these indictments come down. So, and, and I know they're coming because uh, Barr has been hinting towards it. He's out on the, out on the circuit talking You're referring about, to the Durham report? Yeah. It's not even going to be a report. Uh, and he's specifically said that. He's okay. not looking to do a report. He's actually bringing um, criminal actions against some people. Yeah. Yeah. They have grand juries, and there will be indictments. And Barr was explicit about that. And let's not forget, there's the debates. And when people, uh, you know, 100 million people tune in, you and I are very close to this. Our viewers are very close to this. But when mm-hmm. most people who aren't close to it like we are tune in and then they see uh, the, the I, 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 I mean, mentally, you know, I don't think Biden's going to be able to stand up to Trump in, in three debates. So here's, here's, uh, great, uh, here's, here's a peek under the tent. Look at what President Trump did to two of the sharpest men on the planet, Jeb Bush and, uh, uh, and Ted Cruz. Do you think that Joe Biden is at that caliber as yeah. being that brilliant and sharp and articulate? And Rand Paul, yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, Rand Paul as well. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Marco Rubio. Pete, tell everybody where they could find you at Range and uh, your show, which is again five hours a day. My goodness. <laughs> yes, more, morning for two hours, and in the evening uh, for three. In our uh, in the evening, uh, uh, we broadcast at nine a.m. and six p.m. Uh, Eastern time. In the evening, we have. Uh, typically in the second hour, we have a guest. So uh, you can find uh, me at PeteLive.tv. That's the best way to find our live stream. And of course, you can download our apps. they are free apps over at Range Broadcasting. We've got social media platforms, live streaming platforms, secure, uh, basically from free from Silicon Valley intrusion. It's really important uh, as we get uh, closer to the, the election. Pete Please Santelli, don't. you are a patriot. I wish you a very happy Independence Day weekend, whatever it is that you may be doing. Thank you so much. We'll have you back on again down the road. And uh, folks, we'll put the link of my, uh, when Pete interviewed me last week um, of, on, on the Pete Santelli show. Thank you so much, Pete. Best, of, uh, best wishes with everything. We uh, greatly appreciate you being here. Thanks. And an honor. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Pete. And I don't know about you folks. I don't know if I'm more optimistic or more pessimistic after that interview. Those are some tall orders for the president. And, you know, for him to focus on uh, voter ID and social media and, you know, some of the things that we've just been talking about, those are going to be really unpopular actions that the the president is going to take. Yeah, his supporters are going to support it, but you know exactly how the media and the left are going to be responding to it. And so, and whether or not they could be effective or it's going to all be held up in court beforehand anyway. So anyway, uh, boy, it's scary. But uh, speaking about scary, um, I wanted to talk with a patriot. I wanted to, as I mentioned to you at the introduction, I wanted to talk with somebody, you know, it's, it's easy for me to sit here on camera and just yammer on and give my opinions about things, uh, talk about freedom. Um, and there, then there are the people that are out there that are serving this country, military or, or otherwise. And then there are the elites, the folks that we don't hear about. And, you know, when we talk about the warriors that are supporting freedom around the world, oftentimes, you know, they see such horror and they come home and, you know, they're not stars, they're not compensated, they're dealing with emotional issues. Post-traumatic stress, uh, we're seeing a tremendous number of our elite warriors. I've got a good friend of mine telling me the other day, I'll share this with Justin, uh, he, he was telling me, he says he's lost just as many, maybe more now, uh, of his unit to suicide at home than he did in the field. And this guy was in the Battle of Fallujah, for crying out loud. And so what do we do as a country? How do we take care of our own, especially our forces that protected us in the middle of the night so we could sleep peacefully? And so I'm delighted to have joining us now, Justin K. Sheffield. He is the author of a new book called Mob Six, A SEAL Team Six Operators Battles. 
in the fight for good over evil. And just as a quick preface for you, you know, there are, there are the elite warriors, we've seen movies, we've read books, and then there are the folks that we don't hear about. And SEAL Team 6, or Mob 6, as they like to call it, these guys are the most experienced, effective, and deadly warriors in the world. And Sheffield is a part of an exclusive group that could literally be counted on one hand. None have served more combat operations and taken out more enemies of the United States than this guy. More than a thousand operations around the world. And so, you know, coming home, having a family, and going through the process of trying to assimilate is never easy. We're going to talk about that, and uh, I'm going to ask him some questions about what he thinks we're seeing currently right now. So I'm delighted to welcome to the show Justin K. Sheffield. Justin, welcome. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. First of all, thank you for your service. And explain to everybody, a layman like myself, the differences between the special forces and what Mob 6 is. Uh, that's a great question. So, um, you know, you have a special forces group per se, in each branch of the military, although I don't know about the new Space Force. Um, but SEAL Team 6 is a Tier 1 unit, and our counterpart would be uh, the CAG unit, the Army counterpart, out of Bragg. And it's different. It's, uh, it's different because of the selection and the pipeline to get there. So there's SEAL teams, which all of us that uh, become SEALs will go through BUDS, and we go to a SEAL team, whether East or West Coast. Uh, and then you have the opportunity after at least two platoons and some combat time to try out for SEAL Team 6 uh, as a SEAL. And there's about the same attrition rate. So, for example, my class in 05, we started with about 80 SEALs and we had about 25 guys at the end. So it's, uh, it's a little different than running around with boats on your head and getting beat down physically. It's more uh, a dissection of your tactical ability. Wow. Now, you guys serve combat operations, and according to your bio here, you've done more than a thousand? I've done a lot. Yes, sir. Uh, and and what are the, where were the theaters? Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Somalia, um, and a Ooh. couple other places that uh, we'll leave it there. Wow. And you guys are taking out, you know, the enemies of America and freedom, and I'm sure... I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that much of the stories that uh, you can tell haven't been told. We don't see this in the media, right? That's right. So tell us a little bit about the book and, and what you're hoping to achieve with it. Thank you. So, um, you know, I, was, I got in in 2000 and I was medically retired in 2014. Um, a lot of combat missions, a lot of deployments. Uh, and there at the end, when I left uh, the team I was at, I went to a training role. I started going downhill fast, mentally and physically, um, and got medically retired in 14. One of the forms of therapy uh, was to write, and um, when I went to Bethesda, and I started writing there. Um, so last year I got serious about it and wrote this book, but it really goes through um, you know the struggles that I have and, and what we're doing now with the foundation that we started about four years ago we're helping uh, lots of veterans that had similar situation than I had uh, suicidal uh, strung out on drugs and alcohol um, really kind of at the end of their rope and kind of giving up so uh, that's this is shedding some light on that and shedding some light on the help that's out there because a lot of guys don't want to ask for help you know, Justin, one of my good friends, he served and uh, he actually fought in the Battle of Fallujah. And he's, wow. he's told me recently in tears, and this is a tough, tough guy, that he has lost more of his unit at home to suicide than he did in the field. Is that something you see yourself or have seen? I, I have, and it's, uh, it's pretty heartbreaking to hear that because that, that unfortunately is the truth that we're dealing with right now. Um, you know, I'd say at least at my, my last command that uh, it's almost half and half, it seems like. Several guys that I knew very well have, have committed suicide, and you know, I was almost one of those guys. I got caught um, by, my, by my son, and um, I'm, I'm sitting here today by the grace of God. And what I would say to um, 
to our, our service members out there who may listen to this is there's hope. There's hope. And Justin, I'm sorry. I got to ask you about that. Your, your son caught you in the act of committing, trying to commit suicide? Yeah. So, um, I'll try to keep this short. Um, you know, I had, I had pretty much, uh, made up my mind, uh, and, and I had some things planned out, but, uh, essentially it came down to, I was in the closet, my family was gone. So I thought, and my son came up and, and, uh, caught me with a gun in my hand. Um, how old is he? Uh, he is 11 now. So he was about, uh, you know, six or seven when that happened. And, and what did he say? Uh, he said that he went, he he asked me what was wrong cause I was crying. Uh, and he said he wanted to come back and tell me goodbye. I thought they had left and, um, and he gave me a hug and my wife came in and saw what was going on and, uh, kind of lost it also. And, um, and then I, you know, I, uh, I got some help and the help was magnetic resonance therapy at the brain treatment center. And, um, I got off all the medication that I was on, started using cannabis for pain. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, really have gotten better. Um, and, and since then, you know, this treatment's pretty expensive and we have, uh, we've been able to help a lot of veterans with it. Um, magnetic resonance therapy. And you find, you found that to be more effective than the prescriptions and the drugs that we all know lead to suicidal thoughts, right? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I was on, um, opiates, Adderall, um, sleeping pills, uh, and, you know, Ambien, the like, and, and then mix alcohol with that and mix the fact that you're physically broken down, which a lot of guys are. I mean, I had back surgery, multiple discs replaced, and, you know, guys are, they're, they, they've gone, they're at the top, and then all that gets taken away, it seems like, and, uh, and it's a hard place to kind of crawl out of, um, feeling like a failure. And, you know, it's not just coming from where I came from, but a lot of veterans go through this, and it's, what I've seen is very difficult for guys to ask for help. I don't know if you're prayerful or religious, but very much. your son coming back, is that something he normally did? Or do you see that as something more like a divine intervention? Absolutely divine intervention. Um, there's no question about this. I, I am, you know, I've been a Christian since I was a little kid. And certainly, you know, I, I look back on my life. I have lots of regrets, uh, you know, I'm definitely a sinner, no question there. Um, but it is absolutely I'm here because of the Lord. I mean, I could give credit to all kinds of things. You know, this treatment that we're supporting is amazing. I've seen guys truly get their lives back. Um, but uh, but really, it is that's the message I have for the veteran too. It's it's you know at the end of the day, this isn't forever. This life here, so um, eternity starts. And, uh, and so I like to talk to people about the gospel and, and that's, that's a lot what this book is, is culminates to honestly, it's a testimony. I, I, I'm taken back a little bit, which is actually quite abnormal for me. Um, I've done, you know, well over 240 episodes at this point and hearing your story, Justin is just, incredible to me. I'm a father of sons myself, and we've all gone to dark places in our life. Um, and as I mentioned to you, one of my good friends, again, served, uh, you know, he's telling me that he's been there as well himself. And one of the greatest issues, one of the greatest problems that we're seeing right now, and I think I'm hoping that this restructuring of the VA is, is hoping, I'm hoping that, they, that they're addressing this, is that so many of our uh, so many of our soldiers that have come back and you're an elite warrior you know a thousand back. i mean i can't imagine coming back and trying to assimilate back into some level of normalcy after being on an adrenaline you know a level of of, of a thousand percent for so many years are they addressing this now at the VA? Are they, are they trying to prevent people from automatically being uh, prescribed these drugs and taking a look at this magnetic resonance therapy that you're talking about as an alternative or other means to try to prevent this, this, this um, epidemic of suicide? 
I think they're doing what they can, and that's a great question. Um, I've actually talked to uh, a lot of the head shed with the VA over the last few years, and uh, they're doing what they can, and it's no fault to the military, but it's designed very well. I mean, $20 million they spend to train one of us, right? So we get all this training, all this experience, and then at the end, it's sort of, you know, kind of like when America goes to war somewhere. We do great, but there's no off-ramp, right? So the answer to the military a lot of times is medication, and the medication does work for a while. But like you said, I mean, this stuff, I mean, you're, you're on, your brain is on fire, um, yeah. so to speak. So magnetic resonance therapy, you know, we're talking about uh, the neurons in your brain and them, them sort of influencing it with a frequency over a, an electromagnet to not get too scientific. Yeah, so, so what is that process? If you're a patient, you go in, what do you experience? So uh, it's... It's very non-intrusive. Um, you're going to be in there for 30 minutes. You're going to be sitting in a chair, and they put an electromagnet on your head um, to a specific location. They've, de they've determined what frequency to use by an EEG. So about 10 minutes, they'll do an EEG, and some really smart people come up with a protocol to treat you with. And it's 30 minutes a day, uh, eight seconds on the minute for, th for each minute for 30 minutes, and that's about all you can take. You usually crash out, or I did for several hours after a treatment. You're, you're completely gassed uh, mentally and, and really physically too. Um, it doesn't hurt, although you can definitely feel it. Um, but what they're doing is they're influencing neurons to function at a specific frequency and one frequency. For example, my brain was on two. That's not good. Um, you have 30 billion neur neurons in your brain. If 10,000 of them are out of whack, you got autism. So it's pretty delicate stuff we're talking about. They have a double blind study going on right now to get this FDA approved. Um, we all know how long that takes. Um, this thing started probably, you know, back when we started this foundation to pay for guys, cause it is, you know, we're talking six to 8,000 a person. Um, so the donors really have been, you know, carrying the weight on, on this and getting people better. But you know, the results we're seeing are um, people are getting their lives back. Mm -hmm. There's no way I would have been able to sit here and have a conversation with you before. Um, and you have a fund, uh, a foundation for this where people can donate? Yes, sir. It's called, it's called All Eagles Oscar. And that's a call sign that you want to hear coming off the battlefield. Uh, Again, what Oscar. is it? All Eagles Oscar. And it refers that all of us, Eagles, we refer to ourselves as Eagles, are okay. Okay. Um, and alleaglesoscar.org is our website. Okay. Well, we've got, we'll, we'll have that uh, below you here so people can Thank find you. it and support you. Uh, this is a really, really important issue. And heroes like yourself, you know, they, they need, it's, it's already hard enough to come back. But uh, I, I think we're in the stone age when it comes to psychiatric, uh, you know, from the standpoint of, of, uh, uh, you know, prescribing these different levels of drugs that in many cases cause more problems than they're actually solving. And so new technologies like the one that you're talking about here, I think definitely need, you know, our support. Got a couple of minutes. I want to talk some politics with you. Great. Yeah. So we just saw in the news this week and the news cycles are changing every 10 seconds. So a lot of people have probably already forgotten about this, but there was a Pentagon report that just came out that says Russia is working with the Taliban and others, whoever that may be, to expedite the U.S. withdrawals from Afghanistan. What do you know about that and how do you feel about it? Um. These days, it's very hard, difficult for me to believe much that's coming over the news waves. But I will say, this is nothing new. I mean, the Taliban have always been paid by somebody. These guys aren't working. They come in and they take over everything and, and do very evil things to people. Um, much like some of the groups in our own, you know, we have some domestic terrorism going on, in my opinion, right now. But I do think if we're not going to... The domestic, I'm sorry, you're talking about the riots and the looting? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Lawlessness, yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're a little bit more organized over there, and they're coming in and killing folks uh, by the droves. But uh, the Taliban and, and those like it, we can't talk peace deals with them. I mean, I'd love to say that let's go sit down and stop all of it, but it's not going to happen. And um, so we either need to get serious about them being the enemy, or we need to get our people out of there. 
So mind. President Trump uh, has been talking about getting, you know, troops out of Afghanistan for some time. Uh, you've got the neocons and you've got the folks that uh, essentially support the war because they feel that, not that they want troops to die, but they feel that it would allow a vacuum. How do you address that? Uh, I, I, you know, I think, like I said, if, if we're not going to treat this as a war, which we really haven't since the current admit, or the previous administration took over, everything really changed since then. And I think that we need to, to close up shop and come home. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. You know, some people take a look at this report that the Russian government was working with the central government, uh, regional countries, Afghanistan, obviously the Taliban, uh, to gain an increased influence in Afghanistan. Is that such a bad thing for the U.S.? And, and, and if so, you know, why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking from the standpoint that there needs to be some form of structure there so you don't allow the, the evil forces within the Taliban to promulgate and end up with another 9-11 again, right? Absolutely. I think I mean, that's a great question. The problem is, is we're going over there as Americans, and we had uh, a reason to go over there. Um, I, th I don't know that that was lost somewhere. I just, I think that us going over and trying to impose our judicial system on a people who don't believe our way of life, they have nothing to do with our constitution and want nothing to do with it. It's very difficult because we come from a different place being Americans already. I love the Afghan people. I think they're amazing people. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, we're talking about a Muslim, predominantly Muslim country. Um, Christians are killed over there just like they are in, in most predominantly Muslim countries. And so are Muslims. Um, mm. But I think that uh, they're not going to implement our way of life. It's not going to happen. We've tried. We've tried to get a judicial system and open voting. I mean, you're talking about corruption. You know, they made us train these guys to try to take over this this fight, and we're finding bad guys within the ranks that we're training. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, at what point is the co you know is it worth it anymore? Is the is the cost of the soldier? We're over there doing police work. Um, yeah. So I, it's a hard one, man. When you hear reports like uh, Russia, the GRU, uh, they have these uh, programs like bounty programs where essentially uh, they, they were looking, intelligence was looking to pay for bounties of uh, U.S. soldiers being killed. Think about from your standpoint being in, because this is on CNN, this is on other mainstream, you know, relatively mainstream news networks. And while it hasn't been verified, what impact do you think that has on the psyche of the troops on the ground? That particularly, I think they need to be ready for that. They should be ready for that always. Um, okay. You know, the troops on the ground over there, at least when I was there and we were dealing with a lot of Afghan influence and a lot of Afghans coming into our, our camps, even where we lived. I mean, you're talking, you got to be ready for these guys to put a bullet in you at any point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and, the, and the guys and girls that are going over there now, they need to be more vigilant than they ever have, uh, honestly, because there is no, uh, you know, there's no infrastructure like there used to be where there's just, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of combat operations going on. I mean, now you have guys that are living, so to speak, right next to our people uh, that aren't good. And, you know, we have to be very careful how we treat them and so on. So it's... Mm. Uh, it's it's a mess, man. We know that Taliban violence has increased. There are multiple reports confirming that. Uh, but let's step away from Afghanistan for a moment. There's other geopolitical concerns. We see North Korea. We see Iran. Uh, with your background and experience in so many battles, which is the one hot spot that keeps you awake at night right now? Well, there's a couple. Um, I think what keeps me uh, awake a little bit is what's happening in our own country and what I've seen uh, this president go up against our president. Um, I've never seen anything like this and, and, and I don't think I'm alone there. And, you know, I'm only 40 years old, but really what's going on right now is pretty disgusting to me. Um, and, and I think the quiet majority, you know, is, is patriotic and is red, white, and blue. Uh, I'm certainly that way. And, you know, I think it gives a bad message of who we are as Americans, and we'll get through this for sure. But, you know, there's a lot of young people growing up and seeing this right now, and they need to know that this isn't America. I mean, America, we, we, 
we stand up for the oppressed. And, you know, when our number one mission at SEAL Team 6 was hostage rescue, and we never asked if it was male, female, white, black, Muslim, Christian, we're going, and every single one of us would give our life for an American. And um, we need to get that back, that, that attitude. Um, th this is, we are privileged. I mean, you talk about privilege. You're privileged to live in this country. Um, and we have a constitution. The Bible was open when that thing was written. And regardless of what you believe in, this is who we are. And people fought and died for that. And it's worth protecting. Justin, where, where are the lessons being lost right now? Because most of the demographic that we see on the streets across the country are young. They're teenagers. They're 20-somethings. Um, have, have we failed passing on the torch to a younger generation? And if so, how can we get it back? Great question. Um, I think there's a lot to that. Uh, the media doesn't help. And I, and I just mean the broad media. Um, I've seen some, I, you know, this is the first year I've ever been on social media and I'm on there predominantly because I can get actual news, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to watch, uh, you know, news outlets all the time and I realized not saying which one's right or wrong, but the fact that you can watch two different ones and they're so contradictory. One of them's wrong. I mean, they're both wrong or one's wrong, right? So, um, I think that's part of it. I think the education system we have in this country, I would advise and, and, uh, urge parents that have the ability to get your kids in private schools um, or, or even, you know, homeschool because, you know, I look back on what I learned in school and, and what we're taught. I think there's a problem there as well, um, as well as a, a myriad of other things. I mean, you know, dads need to be around. I think the family needs to be propped up. Mom and dad are raising kids and dads are working and we are, we are workers in this country. And I don't know how these, all these people have all this time to, to just break and destroy things. Um, but they should go get a job, you know, and, um, and we're going to be paying for all this stuff to get put back. It's, it's a silly thing to destroy your own house because we'll pay for it. You know, the pack of gum is going to be five bucks instead of 30 cents now or whatever. So, um, you know, I just, I think we need to reinstill the way that we, we, we came about in America. Um, I'm a Christian, so it's all, it's all written. You know, I'm not coming up with any new wisdom. The Lord gave us every single thing we need. And it's right there between those two covers uh, of the Bible. And um, if anything, this country needs a revival and we need to come back to that. So mm -hmm. that's my opinion on it. I'd love to read your book. Unfortunately, haven't had a chance to read it yet. And uh, uh, tell us a little bit about the book and what people can expect, some of the stories and uh, really, you know, w w what it's about in essence. Mob 6, a SEAL Team 6 operator's battles in the fight for good over evil. Thank you. Um, so the book, I'll just say it's, uh, it's definitely rated R. So be prepared for a little bit of colorful language. Um, but it's a very raw account. You're inside my head. Um, I'm not describing things. It's more of you're on my shoulder in my head going through it with me. Um, I was fortunate to be a part of uh, literally hundreds of operations. And I just give an up close personal account of some of those and how it was, uh, for example, to uh, take another human being's life. Um, and, and the feelings that go through your head in a firefight and how to prepare before something like a hostage rescue where you're literally looking at your guys saying you're going to accept rounds tonight. You're going to take bullets for the hostage no matter what. Um, and, you know, I take you through my whole time in the, in the Navy and certainly there at SEAL, SEAL Team 6. Um, I have no regrets being there. It was an awesome place to be. And I would just say that uh, I would encourage young people that are thinking about it to, to join the military there's there needs to be more of that and um, again mob six or uh, seal team six uh highly trained operators you're you're this is an elite and secretive group of the u.s navy seals we think of navy seals as as the highest level you go beyond that so um it's got to be fascinating and uh yeah i'd love to read it and uh, and check it out uh tell folks where they could find you on social media and again drop the link we'll, we'll have your amazon link for the book but also drop the link where people can find the foundation please oh, thank you uh so mob six it's on amazon right now and the foundation again is all eagles oscar and all eagles oscar.org is our website 
And uh, for veterans that are uh, going through something similar than what I just described, go on there. We've got a lot of information and resources available, uh, as well as if you would like to donate to us, uh, you can do it right there. I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Mob6, Justin Sheffield. I'm not hard to find. All right. Justin Sheffield, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your service. Thank, thank you for being so transparent uh, and, and, uh, and wish you a, and your family a wonderful Independence Day. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you, sir. Oof. I, wow. I'm not usually speechless, am I? Um, I, that wasn't intended. I, uh, I didn't expect us to go so deep and um, it got emotional. And I, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm going to say this. Everybody, check out the foundation, check out his book, check out his website. Let's support these guys. They need our help. They need our assistance. They need our thanks. If you have the means, please support the foundation. Um, the, the alternative therapies that are coming online are needed now more than ever. You know, the drugs, the, the prehistoric, you know, stone age, uh, stuff that we're, we're, we're throwing at our, at, at our brave men and women that are coming back from the, from, from the field isn't working. We're seeing suicide rates going through the roof and, um, thank goodness. Thank God. Justin's son came back and found his father. And, um, holy cow, I, I don't, that moved me. That really moved me. Wow. Thank you, Justin, for your honesty and, uh, and, and, and transparency there. Now let's talk about the next generation. Let's talk about the kids and, and the 20 somethings that we're seeing that want to tear down our country and try and rebuild it in their utopian vision. And a lot of that responsibility also falls to us as parents, as grandparents as uncles and aunts and and you know the the fact is is that when you see the, the the level of ignorance and i'm sorry it is ignorance you're seeing the level of stupidity that we're seeing coming from these kids that are screaming epithets and if you disagree with them in any way whatsoever you are a racist or a bigot or whatever you know um we've got a problem because if these, these are the kids and, and young adults that are going to be in charge. And don't think for a moment that if this election, as Pete and I were talking about earlier, goes in the wrong way, they're going to be in charge a lot sooner than we could ever imagine. And so how do we, how do we teach our kids what's right and wrong? How do we teach our kids about democracy versus uh, Marxism and totalitarianism and fascism, true fascism, the type of fascism that Winston Churchill, a statue that they tearing down in England, was fighting against. Well, as parents, we have to do it ourselves. And so Michelle Balcone is returning and delighted to have Michelle back on. She is an author, a co-author with Art Laffer on the Let's Chat About books and uh, put a link up here. Uh, the Let's Chat About Economics and Let's Chat About Democracy. And you can find those at letschatbooks.com. Michelle, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm great, Dave. Thanks for having me. So you're, you've been watching the same news we are. You're seeing, uh, obviously, you know, this civil unrest that's taking place. When I take a look at the demographic, when I take a look at the age of most of these folks that are out there that are tearing down statues that want to essentially, uh, I, I guess, tear down our institutions and um, try to figure out new ways to have economic systems. Most of them are young, Michelle. They're in their teens and then their 20s. What is that telling us, the rest of us here, about their level of education, especially when they're tearing down statues like abolitionists? Yeah, so what I think it means, and I can't speak for anybody else, but I do have children that age, 18 and 20, uh, I think it means they're very angry 
but what I also think it means is that they're going more toward the emotion and the destruction of things instead of offering solutions or fixing or working with people that they're at odds with to fix things. Uh, frankly, I think the foundation of economics is a great decision-making tool when you understand economics you understand who's paying for what, you really have a better understanding of how things work and how to fix problems and how to talk rationally with decision making and skill to bring about the change that you know they would like to accomplish. And what is that change? Yeah, well, again, I can't, I can't speak for them. I know there's a lot of emotions riding high right now. There's a number of issues that people are, you know, either peacefully uh, setting up vigils for or protesting in general. But I can tell you that the violence is not going to change anything. It actually means people don't want to listen to you. And destruction of property, whether it's a statue or the many, many businesses that have been destroyed, that actually sets communities back tremendously. Uh, people have lost a lot of money with the destruction of their property. You could take it a step further to the companies who are insuring those properties, and that in turn makes rates go up. So what I advocate for, and uh, yes, I did ask Dr. Laffer to help me, he's a contributor to the books that I've written, um, is really to teach children from a very young age, we're talking elementary school, to think economically and to understand uh, the term incentives recognize incentives in your own life, opportunity cost. I would say the opportunity cost of all this destruction far outweighs any benefit of anybody who might be listening to people who have a message, but the way that they're carrying it out is completely destructive, shuts down anybody who would want to work with them, talk with them, and makes people mad who may be on their side because they have now destroyed those communities and neighborhoods one block at a time. You know, there's, there's reports that are suggesting that uh, 40 to 50% of all small businesses may not make it through. And now we're seeing lockdowns again because of, of a resurgence, at least in the unreliable, uh, you know, the testing that, that's happening. We talked about this before we went on camera here. How do businesses get through this? And how, I guess it's a two-part question for you, Michelle, because business owners understand free markets and capitalism and competition and regulation. And, and then the, those are just the normal standard pressures of running a business. But when you've got this social unrest, how do they get through this? Yeah, so it, it's a tricky question. And some of the most powerful video accounts that I've seen have been uh, people that live in the communities, you know, really, really letting, uh, I won't call them protesters, but people who are destroying property have it and telling them to get out of their neighborhoods because they don't realize what they're doing. And they're saying, you don't share my message when you destroy businesses. So I think businesses can rely on their community to help protect them in some ways. It's certainly not going to um, save them from a violent attack. But another thing I would tie destruction of property to are property taxes and sales tax. So the loss of that business, as you pointed out, uh, affects the business owner and the employees. It directly impacts the community because the property taxes that they would have paid if they failed, they're no longer paying property taxes. And the sales tax generated from the product or service that they're offering would have gone to help fund the community. And that's public services, that's schools. Yeah. So if you have block by block destroyed. How is there any tax revenue coming to pay for schools, to pay for streetlights? You know, I'm, you know, there are many public services that are paid for out of that. And that stops too. So how do you help? One way you help is through education. You know, I always say if you don't quite understand economics at the federal level or the state level and you don't understand how much money our government has borrowed uh, to pay for our debt that has increased our debt, look at your own uh, budget and your own family. What if someone completely destroyed and took away your job? Many people don't have to imagine that because they've gone through a very rough three months and perhaps have lost their job. Maybe all age, uh, wage earners in the family have or just one, but that's a decrease of your income. How has that affected you? Now, take that to your, your municipality level, your state level, and your government level. You start to see 
the domino effect of what's happening. And the way that we teach economics and then different forms of government in the democracy book is always with an example that would fit a family's own everyday life. Mm -hmm. We use real terms, we use real scenarios, because the only way to increase economic literacy, which was your initial question, you know, people don't realize what they're doing in the economic impact. You have to start at home. You have to start early having these conversations. It would probably surprise most people, your viewers, to learn that all states have K through 12 economic education. So what's happening? Where's the breakdown? I say the breakdown is that we don't talk about it in our own families. A lot of people I'm in touch with don't want to share their personal information with their kids. You don't have to share dollars. Uh, one thing we do is introduce supply and demand with how you spend your time after school. Opportunity costs. Should I, you know, go play with my friends or should I practice my left-handed layup? you know, because basketball tryouts are coming out. Mm. That's how you combat this, Dave, is through education. And talking about it as a family reinforces they're already learning it in school. It's just not sticking. Yeah. Yeah. And as a father, and we have similar age kids, my oldest is 20. And, you know, they, I, I guess just getting out into the marketplace and working for a living and doing the things that we did growing up, you learn and you know they 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 say that uh, you know it's essentially <laughs> the the reality of seeing that paycheck and seeing what fica is and the income taxes that are taken out and wait a minute i worked at chick-fil-a for for 40 hours this week and i earned 200 bucks wait a minute what you know so so they see that for what it is but what i'm seeing on the streets right now and unfortunately, it's being promulgated by an activist media that seem to have a tremendous amount of uh, concern regarding the voices that are being coming from the streets. Many of these kids have never held jobs before. Some of them have gone to college and they've been indoctrinated by Marxist professors in some cases. And they see things through a different lens than most people see through reality. You have these discussions with your kids. I try to with my kids as well. But what, what are some of the techniques that parents should be employing right now during this time that we're in, especially when kids aren't even, in many cases, they can't get jobs right now because there's no jobs to be had. Many of these restaurants are shut down or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. What do we say to them? Oh, sure. I mean, you know, I could, I could talk for hours about this. So, Ideally, you start at home. Whatever your home situation is, you have a lot of economic examples around you. Um, you know, but specifically, I think that you have to start with a goal. Our goal in raising our children, and you know, I started writing these books when our kids were 10 and 12, they're 18 and 20 now. Our goal was to raise independent thinkers, where it literally would not matter what cable news show they're watching. It wouldn't matter what professor they have or what that professor's beliefs are that seep into the lecture because they themselves are independent thinkers and they can see through it and they can look for facts. So if you start with that goal, now work backwards. And I would say a challenge on the job front is you have to look at what the current situation is and who's hiring. There are certain segments of business that have boomed through the past three months one of which are home improvement stores. That's where our son works. It wasn't the job that he had lined up. That was taken away in March, April timeframe, but he's getting a lot of hours, more than he put in for at a home improvement store because that's where business is booming. That's where the need is. So again, it's thinking economically, where should he apply? He had to figure that out because he still had to make the same amount of, amount of money this summer before he goes back to college. Right. So so, oh, I mean, it's, it's real world examples. Parents and grandparents have lived a lot of years through ups, through downs, most of us have anyway. Um, share that experience with your kids, but please do it frequently. They already have learned it and continue to learn it in, in, in the classroom. We just have to reinforce it at home, use examples. It can really be as simple as, you know, for lunch, do you want the apple or the orange and introducing the idea of opportunity cost. Right. Um, 
Most people parent with incentives. Um, the same thing applies to economics. Incentives matter. And so that's where you can look at things um, at the state level and certainly the federal level. What kind of incentives are we offering to encourage what kind of behavior? Um, it, it, when you talk about it, it's a lot more fun um, than it sounds right now because you're just having a real world conversation with your kids. At the end of the day, start with the fact that you want to raise independent thinkers. There's no, there's no um, argument at all that if you turn on a certain channel, you're going to get a certain voice. We flip a lot of channels in our household just to see how different media are treating the same story. So raise your kids with that in mind. They should be independent thinkers. They're going to have their own preferences, but always let them be factually driven. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I've discussed this with my boys all the time. I want them to question everything. Now, your Let's Chat books, and you can find folks, you can find her books at Let's Chat books.com. Uh, you not only talk about economics, but you talk about democracy. And I, I, I feel like in the past few months here that our democracy is under assault. Uh, whether, you know, we're seeing lockdowns, whether we're seeing uh, political parties wanting to, uh, in, in essence, restructure the Constitution, get rid of the Electoral College, uh, uh, you know, make uh, the District of Columbia state and all these different things that we're now starting to see percolate here a little bit. Talk about the discussions that should be had right now regarding the framework of our Constitution and, and how we can engage children and kids, young adults, in the discussions about democracy and why it's so important. Absolutely. So again, you know, this is covered in curriculum, K through 12 curriculum through social studies and history curriculum. This is covered, but we need to talk about it more at home. So a story example I like to use, and this is what Let's Chat About Democracy is built on, is a fantastical treehouse. And the kids involved in the story take turns in running the treehouse, so they use different methods. So you can best teach democracy by showing what it is not and then explaining what democracy is. So for example, we start with forms of government like anarchy, which we're seeing examples of in this country. Yeah. We go into dictatorship. We go into communism. And at the end of the day, the kids arrive at the decision to follow democracy because they value two things, and that's freedom of speech and choice. And that's something that the other forms of running the treehouse didn't have. We also include in this book, which I think is really important, you know, when was the last time a family read the Bill of Rights together or the Pledge of Allegiance? or sang the Star Spangled Banner together. They may, these may be things that are done in rote, um, but when did you really have a discussion based on those elements? So our kids only know what's important to us if we take the time to point it out and to have a discussion with them. And by discussion, it's two way. You know, the, the books are called Let's Chat because these are conversations. You wanna ask your children questions. An easy go-to is, well, you know, for your generation, that was okay, but not for my generation. So start early by building a connection so that these are things that the kids grow up connecting with you on. So there's not so much of a disconnect at the age of my children and your children, 18 and 20. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, Michelle, this is fantastic information. And, and, you know, I think that for parents, and uh, folks that if, you, if you're an uncle or an aunt or grandparents, whatever it may be, and you've got kids at this age group right now, I honestly can't think of a time in my lifetime where it is so critical for us to transfer the knowledge of these values and principles and education to the younger generation. I, I got a really bad feeling that so many of these kids are not getting it in school. You talk about K through 12, Many of them are not receiving, you know, civics and economics lessons. A lot of that has been taken out of our classroom. Um, are, are, do you think we're, we're heading in the wrong direction on that? Last question for you. Greatly appreciate you taking the time here. Do you think we're in the wrong direction of that? Or do you think that there is going to be a push to bring that back to the classrooms? You know, I think, I mean, the, I follow a study, it comes out every two years from the Council on Economic Education. We have K through 12 economic education. Now, how it's being taught and uh, whether or not it's measured with testing, which would always increase the literacy in that area, varies states to state. So I always like to put the onus and responsibility 
in the families and have conversations. I mean, it's so easily to be disconnected and distracted from our children, but it is so important that we stay engaged and that we share our experiences and our decision making with our kids so that they know when they go through it, they're not alone mm -hmm. and that they should have everything figured out. I mean, really the honest answer, Dave, is you have to be connected. And if your kids are a little older, you got to move into it and get going now. If you have younger kids or even grandchildren, please know that K through 12 economic education exists. They understand and are introduced to the word scarcity mm. in kindergarten. You can use it too. Go to the grocery store, talk about economics, plan a family road trip, especially this summer when a lot of people aren't traveling far from home. Talk about the opportunity cost of driving further but having less time on the vacation. Mm -hmm. Use these terms, use the examples with your family and watch your kids flourish. I'll give you one last example that really just warmed my heart and broke my heart at the same time. The first time I ever spoke publicly and gave a class on economics was to a very large foster care facility just outside of Detroit in Dearborn. And this was a group of young girls who for many reasons, almost all involving abuse, were not allowed to live at home. And I taught the class at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning. They had 100% attendance. And those girls took copious notes asking me to slow down, to spell and define every single term. And at the end of our time together, which was a couple of hours, one of the little girls said, hey, when did you first learn economics? You know, I'm already in middle school. How old were you? And I said, well, I was in college when I had my, my first class back in the 80s. And I said, why is that important? And she said, I know with this information, I'm going to grow up to be more successful than you because I'm starting earlier. Wow. This, little girl, this is this little girl who has nothing left but to advocate for herself. So wow. imagine if parents and grandparents took that same interest in wanting to connect with their kids and grandkids to yeah. give them the gift of independent thinking and decision making. It's powerful. That certainly is. Michelle Balcone, author and speaker. Tell everybody where they could find you and your books. Let's chat books.com. It's easy. We've got the, uh, got the hyperlink here below you and uh, folks go check her out. And again, with Dr. Art Laffer, I mean, you know, you know who he is, has been on the show before. Fantastic, fantastic economist as well. So uh, thank you for pushing back against this assault on what we've always taken for granted, which is just, you know, understanding, knowledge, education, and transferring that to our kids. Thank you for everything that you do. And I wish you and your family a very happy fourth, Michelle. Also with you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. And also, again, thanks to Justin Sheffield and Pete Santelli. Great guests. And thank you, our viewer, this July the 4th weekend. Uh, you know, we wanted to really give you a sense of what's important right now. And I, I got to say this to you, you know, this is a different 4th of July than ever before. Many will not see fireworks. Many will not go to the beaches or the lakes or barbecues, whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of places around the country are going back into a, a self-imposed lockdown. And so I think it's really a good opportunity for us uh, to, to do two things. Number one, be strong. And I'm not talking about being strong about freedom and being a patriot and standing up for the United States. I'm saying being be strong for those around us that have been emotionally detrimentally impacted by the last four or five months. And and so and, and the second point in, in I want to finish up with is that Fourth of July, like Memorial Day and, and, and other holidays, have always been somewhat institutionalized and commercialized. But let's remember what this 4th of July really means this year. Let's remember what the, the, the Declaration of Independence meant. Let's remember what freedom means. It isn't some arbitrary word that should be celebrated with fireworks and songs. Freedom is, 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 is a decision. It is an opportunity for us. And if we do not continue to decide to be free as a country, if we do not make the decision to double down our efforts to keep America free, to keep government smaller, 
to give more opportunity for individuals and business owners to create their own opportunity, no matter their race, creed, religion, or sex. If we do not continue to, to, to in essence, water this garden, this experiment that is the United States of America, there are significant and powerful forces right now on our television screens, in our downtowns all across the United States that want to take that freedom. They want to bastardize it and turn it into something that will no longer look like the country that we grew up in. And maybe at times, all of us, me included, have taken for granted. And so let's take this time Let's take this moment, this long weekend, this Independence Day, to remember what the 4th of July truly is about. Because in four months from now, we're at a Y in the road. We've got a decision to make. One decision that is supported by a, a, a big percentage of the population will take us down a very dark road. And one will be continuing to... Uh, live this experiment that allows all of us to have the opportunity. Is it perfect? Of course not. Does there need to be some nipping and tucking and, 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 and improving? Absolutely. But it is the only place in this world where I have the opportunity to sit here and share my thoughts with you without worrying about going to jail. Think about that for a minute. Not even in England can you do that now. So be strong for your friends, family, and neighbors, and double down, double down your dedication to remembering and reminding those around us what freedom truly is. So I wish you and your family a very happy 4th and Independence Day, and we'll be back again real soon here at Whiskey Politics. Cheers.